Putin is raising the cost of his maintenance, meanwhile the State Duma is suggesting that Russians look for good things in the garbage. What awaits Russian citizens in 2025 and is Putin ready to wage war for a very long time? We will talk about this today with our guest, Vladimir Milov. Vladimir, hello, I am glad to welcome you. Hello. The information about a sharp increase in the military budget of the Russian Federation next year compared to the current year has been confirmed, and defense spending will increase by half. As follows from the submitted draft budget, military spending for the next year was planned in the amount of 13.5 trillion rubles. This is about $150 billion. And it looks like Putin is really preparing for some kind of protracted war, but at the same time, both military experts, and we have repeatedly said this that in fact, Russia does not have the ability to wage war for very long. Resources are running out. They also do not have time to produce. What do you think about this? Is Putin really ready for a war of attrition or is it still more psychological pressure? Well, you see, a lot of experts here have fallen for this magic of absolute numbers. Indeed, military spending is planned for next year to be a record. But somehow these conversations miss the fact that the growth rate of military procurement has slowed down very sharply. Because, for example, in this 2024, they increased by almost 70% compared to the previous 2023, but next year an increase is planned by only 26%. This is the slowest increase in military spending since the beginning of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. In 2022-2023, there was an annual increase in military spending of about 35 to 40 percent. Last year there were 68, now only 26 are planned. That is, this suggests that they have obvious breaks for further increasing these costs. And we have discussed here that they need much more money. In other words, you have mentioned the correct figure of 13.5 trillion rubles, they are planning for next year, they would need 15 to 20, no less, in order to solve all the accumulated problems that they have, both in the military industry, and in the supply of the army, and in payments to personnel, which, I think, you see, are growing all the time. Therefore, they set military spending for the next year at the lowest bars, that is, they kind of increased them, but not much. And here we should not forget that we have high inflation, which is not decreasing in any way. If, for example, these 26% indexation is corrected by 8 to 9% of annual inflation, then we get indexation by only 15 to 16%. This is not much. That is, this really does not correspond to the huge holes that they have with the financing of the army and the military industrial complex. Therefore, in general, if you take a systematic look at the budget, which, by the way, I recommend to everyone, today I will release a detailed video on my channel Vladimir Milov on YouTube, where I analyze all this, it is clear that they are forced to shrink significantly, that is, a very restrained increase in federal spending is planned for next year. They believe that they will be able to keep it within only 5%. Let me remind you that this year the growth of federal budget expenditures is 22%, that is, they want to slow down a lot. They plan to keep the budget deficit next year within 1 trillion rubles. Obviously, they will not succeed, but you said about the exhaustion of resources, and it is clear that they cannot afford such a sharp increase in expenditures as before, neither in terms of budget projections in general, nor in terms of financing the war. Therefore, yes, of course, this is exactly what we discussed with you earlier, that they still have opportunities, but the growth rate of spending is directly decreasing sharply. This indicates the exhaustion of resources. They are afraid to spend the money they still have left in the government's financial reserves. They think that they will be able to keep the costs under control. Most likely, of course, not. In general, in general, this budget shows that their attempt over the past three years to keep the budget deficit within some forecasts has completely failed. That is, 
It always goes over 3 trillion rubles a year, and this time the Ministry of Finance admitted that the real deficit will be more than twice as high as what was planned a year ago, when this current budget was adopted. Therefore, I would say that this is such a budget of the coming poverty, when they have nothing left. Yes, somewhere else they are trying to find an opportunity to increase military spending, but it is clear that they are pressing everywhere, that they are going to reduce the growth rate of spending in an unprecedented way. Much fewer can afford it than they could do there, say, a year ago. Therefore, this depletion of resources, it is already noticeable, it is coming. I have not yet started talking about their unrealistic forecasts for oil prices for next year, that is, it is clear that it is becoming more and more difficult for them to make ends meet. Friends, we work live, so you put your likes, write comments, do not forget to indicate from which country, from which city you are watching us. Even if you watch this interview in a recording, also be sure to write your comment. Vladimir, but if we talk about increasing defense spending, and you say that they generally need about 20 trillion, then can they make changes to the budget? If so, where else will they get the money? In what areas will they shrink? Of course, they can always make changes. As a rule, they make them. For example, this summer they made amendments to the budget approved about a year ago, where, say, the deficit was increased by a third, but in the end it turned out that this was not enough for them. That is, this is such a constantly moving target and target for them. Where can they get the money? This is a big question. That is, today they have less than 5 trillion rubles left in the liquid so-called parts of the National Welfare Fund. That is, it is somewhere, let's say, 35 to 40 percent of the annual military budget. That is, not so much of everything, like, for, let's say, four months of military spending. I think that they will spend a significant part by the 1st of January. They usually do this at the end of December, when they close the budget deficit formed for the year. Thus, they will enter next year with even smaller reserves. This is almost guaranteed already. Moreover, now Finance Minister Solunov says that they do not really want to spend the remaining reserves and will rather save them for a rainy day. This is how it was originally conceived with reserves. The next point. They can, of course, borrow money from the market. But there is one significant, but, here. Firstly, foreign financial markets are inaccessible to them due to sanctions and international isolation. They can only borrow on the domestic through these government bonds of the federal loan system, but due to the bad economic situation, high inflation, the high rate of the central bank, the yield on these UFZs is off the charts, that is, it is now close to 17% on the 10-year UFZ, and this leads to a sharp increase in the cost of servicing the national debt. This is also evident in the draft federal budget, that they are growing from one and a half to three and a half trillion in two years. And that, for example, if last year the share of expenditures on servicing the public debt was less than 5% of the total budget and all expenditures, then next year and in 206 it will be closer to 8. A very sharp increase in these expenses, that is, it is several trillion rubles for the payment of these interests. And we see that the Ministry of Finance is not fulfilling the borrowing plan this year, because it does not want to borrow too much, and the market does not want to pay cheaply for the Russian national debt. Considers the government to be unable to service its debts in the long term. Therefore, this is the increase in profitability. The yields of Russian government bonds are, in general, defaulted. That is, it corresponds to countries with a high risk of default. Then they can raise taxes, and they are doing this next year. But this is like chopping the goose that lays the golden eggs, because the company does not have unlimited profits, and if they give a few trillion rubles in taxes, then they will have less money left for investment, this money will not appear out of thin air. This means that this will continue a rather sharp slowdown in economic activity and economic growth. We can already physically see this slowdown in the statistics. That is, they do not have a good choice. 
they can withdraw some money from the economy, but this will lead to a slowdown in growth and to the fact that they will have the same general tax collections. That is, in principle, these are such communicating vessels. Therefore, Putin will twitch for some time. Here he is trying to make ends meet, we see these intensified attempts in this draft new budget. But it is becoming more and more difficult for him to do this, and the exhaustion of resources, which we have talked about more than once, is very clearly visible in this financial document that it is not clear where to get the money. Taxes were already rising, borrowing money on the market is expensive, they actually got out to cut spending, to reduce the growth rate of spending to only 5% quite sharply. Therefore, I am convinced that I will not be able to withstand this, but it is clear that their main step is not to find money, but to reduce costs. We'll see next year how they do it, I think it's more likely not than yes. Analysts at the Institute for the Study of War say that these record spending could hinder the stability of Putin's regime. Do you agree with this? Yes, of course, because even the Russian central bank officially says that this is a race for budget spending. Well, they use such cautious language, not saying outright that the injection of money to finance the war contributes to inflation, but they use a mild term, fiscal impulse. In general, in Russia now, such an ISAP language is so widespread, where you can't directly call a spade a spade, but in general, everything is clear what was really meant. And the central bank directly states that the budget impulse is a very strong factor that not only has a decisive effect on inflation, but also remains insensitive to their monetary policy and high rate. That is, no matter how it is raised, the problem of pouring money into the war economy, which contributes to inflation, will not go away, and this does not depend on the rate. Therefore, yes, of course, that is, there is really a huge problem here. Another problem is that this injection of money into the war and the military industry, it is not accompanied by adequate growth in production, because, firstly, there is a huge shortage of labor resources due to the war and mobilization, there is no one to work. Secondly, due to sanctions and international isolation, Russia does not receive the equipment and technologies it needs, that is, it cannot build new production lines. The central bank describes the main problem that leads to high inflation and tight monetary policy, as well as high rates, as a gap between demand, that is, when money is actively pouring into the economy, and supply, which does not keep up with it. This is due to a shortage of labor, a lack of equipment due to sanctions and other factors. Therefore, there is such a paradox here that they continue to throw this money into the military, but it does not benefit them, they only accelerate inflation. So, indeed, this is a correct assessment, even Russian officials admit it now. By the way, we are talking about the fact that there are no workers and no production capacity, but Putin recently said that the Russian Federation will increase the production of drones by 10 times by the end of the year, to almost one and a half million. He began to give instructions and says that the needs of the Russian army for drones must be covered. Does Russia now have the opportunity to produce drones from domestic parts? And what about that Chinese export ban for the collection of drones? Is Russia somehow circumventing this, or have they prepared in advance? Well, drones in general have the ability to produce. That is, I would divide military products into these three parts. The first is that it is quite easy to produce and you can do without any complex imports. These are, first of all, drones and artillery shells, unfortunately. Or, for example, these glide bombs. That is, here, let's say so, Russia has unlimited production opportunities and dependence on imported components, but it is not critical. The other side is everything that is more complex. That is, these are military equipment, tanks, aircraft, all sorts of different combat vehicles. This is where there is a huge problem with imports. Russia itself cannot produce equipment. Here are high-precision machines for the production of all this military equipment. It was always imported, it had to be imported. Many items cannot be supplied even by China. For example, 
The production of artillery barrels or tank barrels is very, very complex, precise, precision equipment there, and Russia cannot produce it today. Therefore, we see that the Russian military industrial complex has been unpacked into two parts. In fact, in terms of drones, shells and bombs, they can really maintain high rates and, in general, they are not limited by anything. In military equipment, it can be noticed, for example, by the appearance at the front of old, reactivated equipment, that even their production and repair do not allow for the simple reproduction of what is lost at the front. That is, they do not have enough. They are forced to reopen the old equipment, because here production is absolutely failing, and Russia cannot introduce new machines and equipment. Somewhere in between, rockets, because rockets have components, first of all, microelectronics, which need to be imported, and there are great difficulties with this. But in general, Russia can also produce missiles more or less. Thus, you see, from drones, shells and bombs to missiles and military equipment, it is clear that there is a sharp complication and accumulation of problems. This, roughly speaking about the nature of the war, the future, tells us that the less military equipment, the less ability Russia has to conduct offensive operations. At the same time, unfortunately, they will be able to continue the bombing. Bombing, artillery shelling, and so on. That is, this tells us that inevitably the war will move to the positional stage and the ability for large-scale offensive operations in Russia will be reduced due to problems with complex military production. It will also be reduced due to a shortage of personnel, that is, it is clear that it is becoming more and more difficult for them to find people and reserves who are ready for these so-called meat storms, as they say. Thus, it can be seen that the problems in the military industry and the problems with personnel and personnel, they lead to the fact that the Russian offensive potential will be rapidly reduced and is already decreasing, but unfortunately, they will continue to carry out shelling and they have such capabilities. The autumn conscription began in Russia, and according to the decree, from October 1 to December 31, 133,000 Russians aged 18 to 30 will be called up for military service. Conscripts, as always, are promised that they will not be sent to war or to the war zone. But recent events, for example, in the Kursk region, show that it is possible to be captured even without leaving the territory of Russia. And what do you think about this? Will conscripts go to war on the line of contact and will Putin announce mobilization in the future? Or can their system not withstand mobilization and conscription? After the start of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Russia changed the rules for conscripts. Previously, conscripts could conclude a contract with the Ministry of Defense and become professional soldiers only six months after the start of service. Now this can be done on the second day. Thus, the authorities pressure, intimidate, deceive and promise money, forcing the newly drafted conscripts to sign contracts and go to war. Therefore, here is the fact that they promise not to send conscripts to the combat zone, they may not do it, they will be different, they will put pressure on them or try to bribe them so that the conscripts immediately sign a contract and go. I think they will get out of it in the near future, because in this way, well, I don't know how many 100,000 people will try to find through this appeal on mobilization. First, it is true that the Russian economy and labor market cannot afford a second wave of mobilization today. And they will still first of all call up conscripts at a very young age. It will not be easy to find such partisans who are already over 20 and ran away from conscription, and these people are mainly in demand in the labor market. Therefore, it will not be possible to summon a large number of them. Basically, conscripts will be young soldiers, about 18, 20 or 21 years old. I think that a significant number of them will be sent to the service. Another point, recruiting centers, as the experience of two years ago shows, will not be able to cope with both conscription and mobilization at the same time, since there is simply no ready-made 
infrastructure for this. Therefore, while the draft is underway, I think that mobilization cannot be expected. They will try to get by with this, that they simply bend the newly drafted conscripts so that they sign a contract with the Ministry of Defense. Well, they will find themselves, I don't know, a few tens of thousands, about 100,000 people, somewhere within this, but, firstly, this will not solve their problems at the front, secondly, of course, this mass will be much less shelled and less combat ready, and so on. Well, in general, it is clear that the quality of their reserves is deteriorating and deteriorating, they are trying to concentrate the best and most combat ready in the areas where they are now advancing, well, in the Pokrovsky direction there first of all, but but nevertheless, in general, they do not have reserves for a large front line. And it seems to me that this is becoming more and more obvious. And conscription, a new mobilization will not solve this topic, because people will not be ready, at least not trained, this will take time. Thus, the problem of their lack of reserves remains unresolved, just like all these financial challenges with which we began today. Returning to the budget, they say that the cost of maintaining Putin will increase by 25% to 31 billion per year. Previously, it was planned that these expenses would grow only by 0.02%, but still we see that Putin increases his salary, his apparatus and there are some other expenses they have. But in the meantime, the State Duma suggested that Russians look for good things in the garbage, because half of them still cannot buy them for themselves, except for food in general, probably nothing. And now the deputy Vitaly Milanov made an unexpected proposal. Its essence is to equip tables or boxes in special places where you can bring things for a second life, that is, for new owners. Well, this deputy himself says that often in such boxes he finds real pearls, vintage and antiques. What do you think about this, Vladimir? Well, Milanov is a well-known city madman. I would not take his words literally like that, but you see, my co-host came. Look, what is the situation here? The first thing that I think we also talked about is that, despite all this war economy, we see that a significant part of the population, that is, tens of millions of Russians, are getting worse in their financial situation and they are becoming poorer. These are primarily Russian pensioners, who are not given enough indexation of pensions, there is no money in the budget for this. By the way, next year, expenditures, for example, on social policy and subsidies to the pension fund, they will be reduced very much, more than a trillion rubles. So, and they are laying down only 7% for the indexation of pensions next year, it is clear that this will not keep up with inflation. That is, pensioners have been living in the negative zone for quite a long time, when their real incomes do not keep up with inflation and are actually declining. A similar situation is with people who work in the public sector, primarily in education and healthcare, where there is some increase in wages, but they do not keep up with the real rise in prices either. That is, in general, we see, roughly speaking, that Russia is divided into two unequal parts. Tens of millions of people are getting poorer because the budget does not have money for indexation, indexation of wages and pensions is enough. Bogatit is a rather narrow layer that is associated with the army and the military-industrial complex. Well, there are a number of industries that are very dear to the authorities, banks, oil and gas and other things. But there are not many people working there. Therefore, it is not surprising that there is more and more talk about what poor Russians should do, where they should eat, in the garbage dump or in some other way, because people's incomes do not keep up with the galloping rise in prices. As for spending on the president, you know, it seems to me that they are expanding the presidential administration quite seriously, because more and more tentacles need to be launched into society in order to control all the processes there. We see that they are actively getting into people's brains, into what they watch, read, in bed and everywhere. They created new departments, I don't remember, some cultural and spiritual values or something. 
That new department with a large staff in the presidential administration will literally monitor how people comply with this Putin's archaic medieval value line. This, apparently, also requires some billions of rubles of their own. That is, I think that these are not expenses for Putin himself. Putin is largely supported by the oligarchic common fund, where all Russian oligarchs chip in, and although he is a super rich man, his own money is also involved in this process. Therefore, this budget part is only the tip of the iceberg. But this increase in spending on the president, while the rest of the country is getting poorer, I think this is a direct consequence of the fact that Putin is dramatically expanding the composition of his administration in order to try to control society even more, which, well, everything is more difficult to control. In general, people do not like everything that happens there, to put it mildly. Therefore, it is necessary to appoint new commissars all the time so that the people are monitored. By the way, Putin updated the composition of the Security Council and included his former bodyguard Diamond, who after the presidential elections moved from the post of governor of the Chula region to the post of presidential assistant for the military-industrial complex. Well, in addition to Diamond, the council also included the first deputy chairman of the government Manturov and the head of the federal scientific and clinical center Veronika Skovorsova. Who are these people, why are they in the Security Council, and perhaps these are also some distributions over financial flows? Well, I can't say anything about Skvortsova. Denis Manturov, who is the first deputy chairman, is generally a key figure. We also discussed Sergei Chemozov, the head of the Rostec Corporation. This is the largest Russian conglomerate of machine building and military enterprises. It is the sixth company in Russia in terms of revenue after the largest oil and gas companies and banks. The largest arms manufacturer. Rostec receives about a third of the Russian military budget for arms production and, as Chemozov himself said, supplies about 80% of the weapons and ammunition in physical volume of what the army receives. Thus, Manchurov, the first deputy prime minister, is actually Chemozov's personal protege and right-hand man, a kind of hidden shadow prime minister, on whom all the huge cash flows for financing the military complex are closed. In the new cabinet of ministers, Chemozov's influence increased significantly through Manchurov. In principle, I think it would be fair to say that virtually everything that is being done in the Russian state today is in one way or another aimed at redistributing cash flows to this area. Military production, some kind of civilian import substitution, the so-called one, where Rostec plays a big role. And, of course, Manchurov is a kind of monster who sits on the redistribution of all these trillions of cash flows. I am not at all surprised by the role of his influence, but we must remember that Chemizov is behind Manta. It's basically like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. We say, Manchurov, we mean Chemizov and Rostek. As for Diamond, he is Putin's assistant, the former governor of the Tula region. You know, in general, he is such an interesting character, because there are a lot of rumors about him that he will be some kind of successor to Putin for 15 years. But during this time, he did not show himself positively at all. Well, he looks, that is, rather like some kind of overaged dunce. That is, this person kind of fits into the line of Putin's guards, such as Zinichev and others, who puff out their cheeks and seem to be next to Putin, since he appoints them to positions, but nothing is known about any of their successes and achievements. Although Diamond has been working in high positions in government for quite a long time, so I don't know, if Putin is thinking of moving him somehow, well, let him move him. We know that this is kind of a success, when he tries to appoint his former guard somewhere, it never ends, so the more incompetence there is at this level, the better. I would think that the most important of these appointments is the next rise of Manchurov, who is an important figure. And once again, such a right-hand man of Sergei Chemozov in the government, this speaks of a sharp strengthening of the military-industrial lobby, which, if you look at it, 
It seems to me that today it directly competes even with the KGB and security structures for influence in the country. Perhaps, taking into account the money that is allocated there, today it is the military-industrial complex that may dictate the policy that Putin eventually implements. How important is Nabiulina for Putin? Let me remind you that recently the security service of Ukraine announced another suspicion against her, accusing her of the involvement of the Central Bank of the Russian Federation in ensuring the war against Ukraine. Allegedly, Nabiulina knew in advance that Putin was preparing his invasion, and she changed the strategy of the Russian Central Bank to support the occupation, avoid sanctions against Russia for the invasion of Ukraine, and also to facilitate the financing of occupation groups. The materials of the investigation also indicate that the money in the accounts of the Russian Central Bank opened in other countries is actually one of the tools of warfare. We are now talking about those frozen assets that we really want to get from Europe and the United States of America. As for Nabiulina, could she really know about the preparations for the invasion and did she really help Putin so much? I would say that she could not have been unaware, could not have been unaware, that is, she was most likely among a rather narrow circle of people who had been warned in advance, because it could even be seen. The measures of the central bank, which were designed to close the economy and stabilize it with harsh commissar methods in the face of falling markets and capital outflow, confirm this. Well, it is obvious that these measures were prepared, it was not improvised. In general, it is possible to argue about how successful Nabiulina's policy is, but it is obvious, and follows from her own actions and public statements, that this policy is aimed at stabilizing the Putin regime, overcoming its economic problems and, thus, is a direct contribution to the continuation of aggression. Of course, Nabiulina is a war criminal, and she should be prosecuted accordingly. As for how important she is to Putin, I think he is less sure now than he used to be, because she promised him that with these tough rates and tight monetary policy, she would crush inflation. But it doesn't work, and the situation is getting worse. For example, last week's inflation data was 0.2% per week, which is close to the peak levels that we observed, for example, in May to June of this year. Despite the fact that in July they raised the rate again, this does not affect anything. They themselves admit that the situation in the financial market does not react in any way to their rate increase. Therefore, when it has not been possible to extinguish inflation for so long, and the stakes are so high that they negatively affect the entire economy and even the military industry, this, of course, will cause Putin to have more and more questions about it. For example, the same Chemaizov, by the way, complained about Nabiulina in his interview with RBC a few months ago. He said that military enterprises cannot take loans at such rates, unless these loans are directly subsidized by the state. Such a direct hint that the policy of the central bank harms the military industry. That's why Nabiulina can't hold on for long, if she really doesn't achieve some success in defeating inflation, then the questions about what she is doing there at all and whether it's easier to replace her with someone else will come to the fore. By the way, she herself has recently begun to polemicize with some invisible opponents when she speaks. She says, well, we are told that if inflation is still high, then what difference can there be at least to reduce the rate to make money more affordable? Indeed, such voices are massively heard among key lobbyists, including the military. Therefore, I believe that such very serious clouds hang over Nabiulina, if she initially somehow stabilized the market with such harsh commissar methods for a while, now it is clear that these methods do not work, that inflation cannot be extinguished, that a tough monetary policy hits the economy very hard. I think Putin will be whispered in his ear more and more strongly that it would be necessary to exchange Nabiulina for someone more accommodating. It seems to me that this is an interesting plot for the near future.
I just wanted to say that our viewers should like Lusik for the way he got ready here and left, but you still, friends, support our broadcast, write your comments, you can also leave your questions, we will definitely discuss them. Mishustin's press secretary sent recommendations to the editors of federal publications, in fact, a manual on how to properly tell and present news about the budget and tax increases. Zabella had at her disposal a selection of these recommendations, which focused on complex topics. The government refers to these complex topics, for example, everything related to the increase in taxes and other mandatory payments, namely the expansion of criteria for the payment of excise taxes on sugary drinks, an increase in excise rates on what Russians love, ethyl alcohols and cigarettes, an increase in corporate income tax, requirements for a minimum wage for recipients of a single allowance and much more. And these manuals also indicate that both the media and federal channels should focus on the positive aspects of innovations. And if we don't talk about the fact that prices are not rising, and there are taxes there too, then what, will Russians not notice this in stores? Of course, they will notice, these are taking on such comical forms. For example, when Putin spoke at the St. Petersburg Economic Forum in June, initiatives to raise taxes from January 1st had just been announced. You can go right in and see, it's very funny, but in his other speeches too, if you open his speeches on the Kremlin website and search for the word tax, then after reading what he says about taxes and changes, you may get the impression that all this was started in order to provide some kind of tax deductions. And there is a system that they raise the tax as a whole, but in order to sweeten the pill, someone somewhere is given some separate deductions, that is, the state collects more money from everyone, but someone wins somewhere separately. It's kind of like the lottery business, roughly speaking, yes, everyone pays for lottery tickets, but a few people win the jackpot. If you listen to Putin, you get the impression that this state does not take three trillion from the economy, but on the contrary, somehow gives them away in the form of deductions. Well, it really sounds very comical, it is completely contrary to what is happening in real life. Apparently, everyone who comes into contact with this so-called tax reform, for example, is terribly faltering. This, by the way, breaks through. I also posted a video on my channel where representatives of small businesses speak in the state Duma and say, you are simply destroying us with all this business, and we simply cannot survive with these changes. That is, it still reaches the public space. I think that the authorities are very dissatisfied, so they send out such methodological information so that they do not talk too much. No, people, of course, see what is really happening. And with such cheap propaganda, which simply distorts everything 180 degrees, well, they will not be able to cover up the whole thing. It seems that this winter Europe will not freeze after all, but perhaps the Moscow region, because they're in Chekhov, boiler house operators took to the streets, who report that they may quit altogether due to the fact that they have very penny salaries, but even more so that not a single boiler house is ready for the heating season. And what awaits Russia in winter? A difficult story. I think you can remember last winter, when it was just vomiting all over the country. Somewhere there were these, there were such maps of the breakthrough of heating mains in various reports. And right all over the territory of Russia there were these many red dots. There were many real accidents, where not only houses, but also entire neighborhoods were without heat in the cold, and these heating mains simply broke like thin threads. I think that now this situation will be much worse than even a year ago, because the utilities and heat supply sectors are one of the sectors most affected by the war and the shortage of personnel.
even such a publication of the central bank, which is called monitoring of enterprises, shows that the sphere of housing and communal services and heating is one of the most affected. There is one of the most acute shortages of personnel, as there was a large outflow of people, and voluntarily go to war or work in the occupied territories, where you can get certain bonuses compared to the usual poor Russian regions. Utilities, along with, for example, logistics, agriculture and manufacturing, is one of the areas most affected by the shortage of personnel. There are estimates that the shortage of people in the utilities sector ranges from hundreds of thousands to a million or more, and there is no one to fix all this, roughly speaking, there is no one to service it. I think that in winter the heating mains will be torn much worse than what we saw last year. There is not long to wait. Frosts, in principle, will come soon. Therefore, I think that this will be one of such severe unpleasant consequences of everything that Putin has arranged with this war. Are utility rates rising? Yes, and next year's budget includes a forecast of their growth by 12%, which is as unpleasant as possible. We saw that this July, when utility tariffs were raised by an average of 10%, this led to weekly inflation in early July reaching almost 1%. And this made a very strong contribution and prevented the central bank from taking its measures to cool down inflation there. And there is much more. That is, from October 1st, for example, we have increased the recycling fee for cars. They predict that only in the next couple of months, because of this, car prices will increase by 10%. Cars make up about 6% of the inflation basket that Rostat calculates, so this is a significant contribution. Utilities, car prices, then it went here. For example, telecommunications internet providers are constantly raising prices for communications due to the degradation of Western equipment, because of sanctions, because you have to go to hell there and find out why it all costs more. Along the perimeter, you can see that a lot of such basic services of everyday demand are constantly becoming more expensive and contributing. Gasoline, by the way, is also not calming down, and the role of road transportation in the Russian economy over the past three years has increased significantly due to a full-scale war and the restructuring of logistics to Asia. Therefore, all this will also contribute to the constant high inflation. And yes, there is no good way out in the utilities sector, because everything is worn out there, repairs and modernization need to be financed somehow. There is no money for this. So they raise tariffs, tariffs contribute to inflation, and then this endless spiral went on and on. This week's rise in oil prices will be the highest since February 2023. Bloomberg writes, rising another 8% due to tensions in the Middle East. The day before, oil rose in price by 5% after US President Joe Biden admitted that the option of strikes on Iran's nuclear or oil facilities was being discussed with Israel. And what will happen next with oil prices and can we say that it is really beneficial for Putin to continue to blaze there? Putin, of course, benefits from oil prices rising. The situation there is not easy, because I think that Putin also understands that Iran's full-scale participation in the conflict with Israel does not bring anything good to Iran. In particular, Russia is counting heavily on Iran and its direct military assistance, because Iran has supplied and plans to supply a lot to Russia. For example, we have been talking about ballistic missiles lately. A war with Israel will greatly slow down Iran's ability to help Russia. This is the number one moment. Point number two. 
you know that in addition to Ukraine, Putin has been carrying out aggression in Syria for almost 10 years, where Russian troops are stationed to help keep the regime of Bashar al-Assad. In fact, all this rests not only on Russian bayonets, but also on Iranian assistance, among other things. Any serious blow to Iran's military and geopolitical capabilities would call into question the stability of the Assad regime in Syria, requiring either the deployment of new forces or something else. That is, this axis of Russia plus Iran in Syria will be weakened. I'm not sure that Putin is good. For example, you see the latest Israeli strike on the base in Kamermum, where they attack the transport of Iranian weapons for Hezbollah. Nevertheless, it is a base where Russian air forces are also stationed. That is, Russia will also fly in from this conflict. Therefore, of course, this is a non-linear situation for Putin. Yes, it benefits from rising oil prices, but there are a lot of other consequences. As for oil prices, look, all factors fundamentally lead to their decline. That is, there is not enough demand, China is slowing down, China is very quickly switching to electric cars and they are replacing internal combustion engines. All the time, oil demand forecasts for China are revised downward. There is a recession in the Eurozone, America is somehow balancing, it is not very clear yet, but in terms of supply, there is a surplus. And many OPEC countries are already tired of maintaining these quotas, they are really losing money with lower prices. And there is a growing talk that quotas should be abandoned and production should be increased. There is a surplus in the market. That is, here I do not see a trend for a long-term increase in oil prices, rather the opposite. As for all these geopolitical tensions, we have seen in recent months and a year how conflicts flare up between Iran and Israel, but they tend to fade away quickly. I think the key reason here is that Iran is not ready for a protracted war with Israel for such mutual destruction. Therefore, there will be an exchange of blows, but I do not particularly see this escalation into some kind of ongoing conflict, especially since it does not have great prospects. They do not have a common border, there are two large countries between them, Syria and Iraq. How they will go to each other, this is also such a thing. Therefore, there will be some kind of exchange of blows, here it is, we see it. But whether this will lead to a protracted war, I very much doubt. We have seen oil prices jump many times on fears of a full-scale war between Iran and Israel, but then this does not happen, and prices bounce down again. I have a feeling that this will be the case this time as well. Vladimir, thank you very much for the conversation and for finding time for our broadcast. Wishing you a good and peaceful day. I remind you that Vladimir Milov was in touch with us. Friends, like, write a comment and, of course, subscribe to our YouTube channels. Thank you all for your attention. Good news and see you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.